Right. Okay, so our next speaker is Professor Joshua Bengio. He is someone that we don't really need to introduce anymore. So he's a full professor at University de Montréal. Uh, he's the founder and scientific director of MILA and also the scientific director of IVADO. He is one of the leading experts in AI and has received in 2018 uh, the Turing Award with two other uh, great contributors to deep learning. So thanks, uh, Dr. Joshua, uh, Professor Joshua Benjo, to uh, accept kind of like uh, talking to us today about how to navigate the chemical space. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm going to talk about a number of related subjects that have to do with the search in complicated discrete spaces like that of molecules or even continuous for confirmations, um, which are important in the process of drug discovery, of course. And the aspect of exploration in that space and uh, being able to generate a uh, good diversity of candidate solution is going to be central, as you can see from the title. Right. Uh, I guess I don't need to motivate why we need machine learning uh, in scientific discovery, but just as a, a kind of reminder, the way that we've been doing scientific discovery and you know drug discovery or other areas um, has completely changed. It's going to change even more in the future because we're now able to run large scale experiments and the amount of data we're collecting, especially collectively with many labs and organizations, is just too big for human brains to uh, uh, to deal with. And so we need machines to help us um, make sense of that data and um, in particular do two things. There are two things that are important in the, the use of machine learning in scientific discovery. One is coming up with scientific hypotheses and the other is coming up with experiments, experimental designs, like what, what should we try next experimentally? Or where do we put our computational resources? Sometimes it's it's also similar kind of discussion. And so it's, it's good to see how that fits in the bigger picture of scientific discovery. We accumulate experimental data. Uh, we analyze it. We try to model it maybe. Uh, from that uh, kind of unsupervised analysis of the data, we then generate explanatory hypotheses, you know, about how this could work. And here the emphasis is hypotheses plural because there may be uh, you know, multiple interpretations of the data. And in general, there will be. Um, we have to take into account the uncertainty about the right explanation for that data to drive the next step, which is to design you know, experiments for the next round. And of course, do the experiments accumulate data? You know, it goes like this. Um, the um, the thing that really drives um, a lot of the insights and inspiration for methods that my group has been working on is the assumption that this exercise of finding good hypotheses or good candidates for experiments is fundamentally difficult. That we're and it's difficult because we're looking for a few needles in a haystack. In other words, the space of potential uh, hypotheses to explain data or the space of potential candidates that we could experiment with that could be you know, interesting is huge, is exponentially large. And only a very, very tiny fraction of these are good in some sense. Um, so why is this important? It's important if you think of it geometrically, right? So if you throw darts, like you basically run, try things randomly, there's no chance you're going to find something good. Um, and one of the main messages here is we can use machine learning, in particular what's called amortized inference, in order to help decide where to throw darts, whether it's in the space of uh, hypotheses or the space of uh, candidate um, for experiments. Um, we're going to take advantage of the ability of machine learning to generalize in order to make good guesses, which otherwise would be as I said, like uh, impossible. Um, so 
we may have some clues, we may have some cases where we have found some good things, right? And that's data that allows to generalize to make guesses about where there might be other good things or even better things, right? So that's that's the principle that we're going to try to exploit. Um, and in general, uh, this search, especially uh, like in, in, in context here of uh, searching for molecules, um, that search isn't just about like which candidate is better in the sense of like better affinity or something like this. Usually it's much, we may have uh, many different properties we care about. I'll come back to that. But also at a more abstract level, as I said, we want a diversity of candidates. Um, so I'll come back a lot on that. But uh, uh, fundamentally, the reason we want diversity is that the way we are evaluating those candidates is going to be imperfect. And so we can't put all our eggs in the same basket. I'll, I'll come back to that. And then the other thing we care about is novelty in the sense that we already have some candidates and we don't want to just repeat the same thing. We want to explore far from the things we know, ideally, right? So, so that aspect of novelty is important because uh, local search, like little tweaks, is much easier, and of course we, we we should do that. But what is hard, and that you know we should give value to, is discovering things that are good and far very different in nature from the things we already know. Okay. Um, another concept that's very important when you think about this exploration is the concept of active learning. So remember, we have this loop where we can do experiment and then like modeling and proposing new experiments. Um, how do we choose those experiments? Isn't just about which ones are, you know, expected to be better according to some metric. Um, we should take into account the fact that there is a loop that we're going to be continuing that over and over multiple times. And so the idea of active learning is uh, because we know we're going to do more experiments, we can afford to be exploratory, to seek information, for example, about regions of space where we don't have enough information and there could be something good. Remember, we, we're looking for this needle in the haystack. So um, in areas of the space where uh, we're not sure that there's something good, but there could be based on the data we have, uh, we should be exploring, right? So uh, it's something related to the exploration versus exploitation dilemma and reinforcement learning. If we only go for exploitation, we basically just repeat the things we already know. Exploration is about trying to uh, consider our uncertainty to also drive the search. Um, the other issue with active learning is um, in order to train the system that will uh, produce candidates, um, we can't just repeatedly, you know, ask the experimenter to give us more and more data because that's too expensive. So, so the typical setup is one where we introduce a proxy for the experimental design. Right, so like think of a neural net that predicts the property you care about. The advantage of working with the proxy is that we can use the proxy to train the machinery that will propose candidates. So we, you know, we can like basically in silico, we can say, well, how about this candidate? Uh, we haven't done the experiment, but we can ask the proxy, which is say a neural net that can generalize to new things that haven't been seen in the data. And in this way, we can train the machine that generates candidates so that it generates candidates that the proxy thinks because of its generalization uh, might be good. All right. So of course, this comes with uh, issues because the proxy isn't the real experimental bench, right? It is an approximation of it, hence the name, and it's gonna make errors and it's gonna have uncertainty about its output. And we need to take all of these things into account. By the way, there's a thing I forgot to say. This is a summer school. You're here to learn. Um, please um, interrupt me anytime. And, you know, we don't need to wait for the end. If you have questions, just raise your hand. 
Yes. Good. Sorry, can you speak louder? Yes. Same thing, same thing. You can call it in many different ways. Yes. So, by the way, um, often the way um, people do this, which is they only have a proxy. Like they, they train a neural net that is trying to replicate the answers, the experimental outcomes. And then they will do a kind of exhaustive search in a small space for the inputs, like the candidate description, that will give a high value of the proxy. So that's like a standard thing that people do. But the reason here we are like looking at it from a different angle is we're saying the number of possible candidates to consider is exponentially large. So we can't list them all and try them. So we're gonna have to use machine learning in a generative mode to propose candidates out of this exponentially large set, right? Any other question on, on, on this? Yeah, just don't hesitate, really. Yes. Oh, that's a good idea, microphone. Um, if you're continuing to train on, uh, let's say confidence of a model, wouldn't that just push, push the model to fine tune and less extrapolate outside of this defined chemical space that you have experimental data for? So the proxy is just like another machine learning box, right? And it has all the issues and uh, caveats of machine learning methods. So of course, when we train that proxy, we need to be careful about generalization. And you're right, we also need to be careful about out of distribution generalization. So because we're gonna be continually expanding the, the region that we're exploring, uh, the ability of the proxy to generalize out of distribution is going to be important. I, I don't think I'll have time to talk a lot about this today, but uh, a large part of what we're doing in my group um, is about causal discovery. So causality comes as an important ingredient to eventually face that challenge of out of distribution generalization. You can think of causal discovery like generating scientific hypotheses about how the, the, the you know how things work in the real world. You know what is actually happening. And the advantage of having a causal model for, for that is that uh, it, it will generalize better out of distribution. Like if you, if you have a good grasp on the mechanisms by which you know, outcomes arise through in, in, in experiments, then you're in, in a very good position to be able to predict outcomes of experiments that could be very different. And I think of it like if I know the laws of physics that apply in that particular place, it's the same laws of physics in a different place. And that's why causality is so important. But I think there's a lot more research to be done to get there. We're able to do these things on very small scale, but certainly not yet at the scale of modeling like a typical um, chemistry or biology experiment. But but that's that's a, a research you know a direction in its own right, which which is very important. Okay. Um, there are also connections. So active learning uh, is connected to other um, types of algorithms, um, in particular what's called black box optimization. So you can think of uh, this setup as the, you know, the experimental um, uh, machinery um, is a black box. Like we would like to know what it is. That's the causal discovery part, but, but uh, in general, we don't. And so, um, a, a typical thing that has been done is asking the question, you know, what input should I give to this black box so that it produces the output that I want? You know, what, what chemical, what compound should I try in order to get a compound that, you know, has high affinity? So that can be stated as a black box optimization problem, right? So you've got this black box, you don't know what it is produces an output, let's say a scalar, you'd like the scalar to be large, but you don't know what input to give. So it's basically an optimization problem. You're searching for inputs that maximize some quantity, but uh, here is black box. We can't compute derivatives of that quantity. Like, And so, um, yeah, we have to use uh, other optimization methods. But here, as I said from the beginning, we're interested in the exploration aspect. So I'd rather call this black box exploration. We're not looking for a single solution that's good. We'd like to get all of the inputs, all of the, say, candidates that produce a high value of this uh, unknown function f. 
And of course that applies in uh, discovery of new drugs, new materials, experimental design, and also in causal discovery. Um, okay, so let's go back to this question of diversity again. Um, why is diversity of the candidates we're gonna be proposing to the experimental to the experimenter, why is that diversity so important? So you see on the right side, you see um, the typical funnel structure of drug discovery, where you have um, initially maybe you know a large number of candidates, but we're going to evaluate them with a with a uh, uh, something that isn't right uh, the right the, the 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 correct uh, quantity we care about. So the correct quantity we care about is the outcome of a human trial, you know, um, and that's incredibly expensive. We can't do many of these things. So initially, we might just do in silico screening, like maybe some chemical model or even a you know machine learning model that allows us to get rid of the candidates that look bad according to this proxy. You know, and then we keep the best ones um, for maybe an in vivo screening, uh, like you know uh, single cell experiments or things like that. And then those that fail, you know, at that level, we throw away and we keep the best ones for animal trials and so on, you know, and eventually human trials. So, so that's like a standard structure of how drug discovery proceeds. But what, what does it mean for the exploration problem I've been talking about? What it means is that like on the front line, for example, for the in silico screening or the cell uh, in, in vivo screening, we're gonna use um, a score for the candidates, which isn't the right one. It's gonna be, you know, a cheap approximation of the right one. It's going to be wrong sometimes. And that is why we need diversity. Like if we only come up with like one candidate or like one type of candidate with small variations, and it happens that our proxy is wrong for it for that you know region of space, then we lose everything. But if we have a thousand different kinds of candidates, that's the diversity, right? They're far from each other. Then even if half of them turn out to be wrong, we might end up with something good, right? Or even if if we have a thousand candidates and you know 999 are bad, but we get the one you know that is really different. So it's it's all about not putting you know all your eggs in the same basket because those baskets have a good chance of being wrong. Right, so so that's the the motivation. Um, okay, so I talked about active learning, and I said there's this notion of exploration, and we need to, to take into account the fact that we don't know what the outcome might be in some regions, in order to help drive the experimental design. So, in order to like go a little bit deeper on this question. Uh, I need to explain something about uncertainty. So when we train a model, let's say, and it's going to make errors, it's, um, I mean, the errors are just a reflection that we have the wrong model. It's, But we can quantify those errors as a basically a kind of uncertainty, right? We're not sure, because the model makes errors, we're not sure what the right answer should be. Okay, so now it's important to think about two different kinds of uncertainties, aleatoric uncertainty and epistemic uncertainty. So aleatoric uncertainty is the inherent uncertainty. So that, you know, if we, even if we had infinite amount of data, infinite amount of compute, there would still remain uncertainty because let's say it's noise in the experimental setup, right? Like there's just unpredictability that's inherent to the thing you're trying to predict. You can't, go, I mean, ex except by changing the experimental design, uh, the experimental setup, you can't uh, reduce that. It's irreducible. But there is epistemic uncertainty is the other side of the coin. It's what is reducible if you had more data, more experimental results. So epistemic uncertainty, epistemic means knowledge. It's uncertainty due to lack of knowledge, or insufficient knowledge, which means in machine learning, insufficient data, because the knowledge comes from the data, right? I mean, you also can also use prior knowledge, but in any case, you have a part of the error that could be reduced if you did the right experiments. 
And so this is the thing we care about. Like we want to measure it so that estimate it, because it's going to be an estimation, so that it can help drive the search to put more emphasis in places where uh, there is more of that uh, epistemic density, meaning we can reduce it more if we did experiment in this region of space. Um, of course, there are different kinds of uncertainties, things. So, for example, if we had a consider a compound that has um, currently is predicted to be really bad, and the uncertainty, you know, let's say, you know, on a scale to zero to one, one is good and zero is bad, and let's say it's 0.01, and, you know, with uncertainty, uh, epistemic uncertainty, maybe it could go to 0 0.02 or 0 0.03, but that's still like far from what we want. So that sort of uncertainty, which could be fairly large, but it is for sure, it's not going to give us something we want. Isn't that important? So it's not, ju not just the magnitude of the uncertainty, but is it likely that because of the uncertainty, we might be missing something really good? Okay, so it's a slight variation on this. Okay, so, so the ideal setup, um, but we, that we can't completely deliver on, but that, you know, they're where we want to go with this kind of research um, is illustrated here. So let's see what all these arrows and, you know, characters are. Okay, so on, on the right-hand side, what's called the real world is sort of the experimental uh, bench or whatever, you know, you do actual experiments. And um, and the, the specification of which experiments to do come from our learning agent, like, you know, the girl on the left who imagines things that could be great. Um, and then of course we take the experimental results and we put that in a data set. And then we use that data set to update a model that's going to be a proxy for the real world. Ideally, that model is both causal and Bayesian. So I've talked about causal a little bit because that's going to give us better out of distribution generalization. And I've talked, I haven't mentioned Bayesian, but basically Bayesian machine learning is all about estimating epistemic uncertainty. So it's, it's just another code word for um, knowing what you don't know, like knowing that you don't know, right? Uh, which can be quantified. And as I said, is important to construct um, a kind of score for the, 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 the little girl on the left um, that tells her, oh, this is potentially interesting, both because it looks like it, you know, it, it has a high score in terms of uh, affinity or something, but also because the uncertainty is large, and so it might be even a lot better, right? So, um, so then what happens is that the little girl is going to learn by interacting with this uh, this world model that that captures uncertainty, and she's going to train herself in silico um, by imagining experiment and then asking the world model, okay, so how would that look like according to the model and how much uncertainty is there in the answer? And then use that to update itself to create uh, a better generative process for producing candidate experiments. So there's nothing new here from what I've talked about. It's just like trying to put a lot of these things together. All right, um, now let me, bring up another aspect. So generate, like we're gonna dig now into how we can generate these experimental designs. So in particular, ex, you know, candidate molecules or candidate uh, proteins or whatever. Um, so in general, these candidates are not like simple vectors that we're used to in machine learning. They're structured objects. Like uh, they have, uh, you know, they can be represented by a graph, for example. And so how do we, how do we search in that space and how do we generate candidate objects in the space of something very discrete and structured like molecules? So a very simple idea is that we can make small changes to a candidate and at some point decide that um, we're good. Okay, so we, we, we have something, you know, we'd like to evaluate the score of. So in the figure, you see um, you know, we start with something and then we add some pieces and there are many different kinds of pieces we could add. So there's a kind of tree of all the possible things we could do. 
And in fact, it, as I, I'll talk about later, it's not even a tree, it's a graph because you could reach the same candidate molecule in different ways. I can you know, first add that and then add A and then add B, or I can add B and then add A, right? It can be the same. Um, and, and we have to think carefully about, uh, you know, searching that space that may have sort of local minima and so on, uh, what that means. Okay, so, so then I'm gonna shift gear and go into more of a, you know, machine learning uh, question of how do we learn to do these things, to generate these discrete structured objects like graphs um, uh, that, that have a high score according to something that incorporates both our uncertainty and our expectations about the outcome of the experiment. Okay. Uh, and fundamentally, we need, a, just as a repeat of what it's something I said earlier, the reason we need this, or the case where we need this, is the case where we can't just consider a list of, say, a million uh, candidates and just score all of them and, and, and take the best ones. This is, sometimes you can do that, but the problem we're trying to solve here is where the space of candidates is too large. There's no way we can, like, run a neural net on 10 to the 20 different potential candidates. So, so then really the only option is we have a neural net which generates candidates, right? It doesn't need to look at all of them. It just generates candidates that, you know, seem to be good according to what is learned. Okay. So in, in a more like mathematical terms, one approach to generate good candidates in a way that's going to produce a diversity of candidates is to say, let's make our generative a model, which which samples from a distribution, sample from a distribution that is proportional to our score, which we call here a reward function. Right? So we've got somebody gives us this function. That's the um, you know the 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 model here tells us whether a candidate, um, say molecule looks good in the sense of information we might gain, you know, and it's relevant information. Um, because it might be a very good one. And so we get a high score, if that's the case, and we have this black box that we can query that evaluates a candidate uh, you know, as something we'd like to do in our experiments. If, if the reward is large, it's something we want. If the reward is close to zero, uh, we don't want it. Okay, and, and we're gonna assume this reward function is positive. That's easy to deal with. Um, because we want, we're going to make the distribution that the generator samples from try to be sampling proportional to the reward. So normally in reinforcement learning, we don't do that. When we have a reward function, we uh, are looking for a way to construct like solutions that maximize the reward. But here, because of the diversity question, um, we are trying to solve a different problem. Instead of maximizing the reward, like looking for the molecule that has the highest score, we would like to get all the molecules that have a high score because we know that score is not reliable, right? That's the diversity thing. And you notice that if we have a distribution that has multiple modes, right? So at the peak of those modes, there's going to be a high value of the probability and when we sample from those modes, I think I have some pictures yet. Yeah. Imagine like this distribution would has, has these three modes, right? So if I sample proportionally to, you know, uh, that reward function and I get a density or a distribution, when I sample from that IID, like in normal sampling, one after the other, um, I'm gonna quickly cover all the modes, right? Because, you know, I could pick any of the modes. And if I do this a thousand times, I'm gonna have a good coverage of all the modes. So what I'm trying to say is that the task of sampling in a diverse way solutions that could all be good can be turned mathematically into a problem of learning to generate from a distribution that is specified by a positive reward function. So we want to sample proportionally to that reward function. Any question on, on, on these things or the things I've been talking about? It's getting a little bit more complicated. So yeah, don't hesitate to ask. All right. Yes, here.
I so I think the the diversity um, maximization thing that you're talking about is like it's pretty compelling. I'm wondering if like in a drug design pipeline, eventually at the end you have to narrow down sure. a very small set of candidates. Yes. Right? Yes. Usually like yes. Depending on what kind of experiment it is. Yeah. So I'm wondering how do you let's see. Is there a, a point where you have to kind of clamp down on the diversity and go for maximization? In fact, you probably want to do it at every step. So um, here's a kind of uh, way to think about this. Um, let me use this like simpler figure. So once we've trained our generator, um, we could just sample from it. That's what I've been saying. And then use and send that to the experimental system. But there's a better way which is a very small, simple variation. We sample more than needed. Like let's say we can do a thousand candidates and let's say we're gonna sample a million. And then we take that million and we can like take the 1000 bests and maybe trying to keep diversity along the way, but using just simple like algorithmic things, no like machine learning. So, um, and in, in at the last step, right, like let's say we're going to do a human trial. So we, we can only do one. So we're going to take the best, right? So we can still generate a lot uh, in the computer, but then we're going to use our proxy to say, well, we only have this budget. So we're going to take the ones or the single one that's best, for example. So you can always use your proxy to filter as you would normally do. If you didn't use a generator, you would use a proxy to filter a large list. But here, it's the the, la the large list is going to be obtained uh, using machine learning, like to generate a list of di diverse candidates. Is that does that answer your question? Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Yep. I thank you very much. Just a very quick question. Yeah. Uh, if you are trying to reweight, let's call it this way, all these. The reinforcement policies through this Boltzmann weight, let's call it this way. Yeah. You may also have the same problem that all the people that sample things in, in for example, molecular dynamic, like try to get stuck in some sort of states and so on and so forth. Uh -huh. I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to talk about that. Okay, that was the next slide. Um, yeah, and and maybe here I want to make the connection to things like molecular dynamics and physics. So, so this, this uh, task of mapping a function that is positive to a distribution is a standard task in, you know, in chemistry, physics, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, computer science that we usually uh, use Monte Carlo Markov chain methods to do. Um, and in physics, this corresponds to trying to learn from the Boltzmann distribution. So the Boltzmann distribution just means, okay, I'm given an energy function and I'd like to sample from the distribution that's proportional to E to the minus energy, right? And you could put some temperature there. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's not a new problem. It's a standard problem, but as you say, it suffers from issues. So that's the slide. Uh, we're gonna talk about that issue. Um, so the issue is mixing between modes. So the problem with the MCMC method, so the way it is, uh, the way they work is by making small of a current candidate um, and then prefer, you know, the candidates that give you a higher score, lower energy. Um, and you can see that this local exploration might get stuck around regions of low energy or modes of distribution. If like, if you look at the figure in the bottom, if the modes are close to each other, then by chance, you might just jump from one mode to the nearby mode. But if the modes are far from each other, like you know the, the, the group of mode on the left and the group of modes on the right, then you can actually make calculations to see, so what's the probability that it finds a way to go from that mode to that mode? And unfortunately, that probability gets exponentially small as the modes become like farther from each other. Um, one way to think about it is in between the modes, there's like a flat region where you don't know where to go. And you could, you know, in one dimension, you could equally go left or right. 
uh, but in high dimension, it's going to get really bad because it's like it's the needle in the haystack, right? So um, that's a huge problem for MCMC methods. So what's the solution that we're like going to be uh, working on? Is um, is going to rely on the ability of machine learning to generalize. So now we can look at the figure on the top right. You know, you have these three modes that you have already discovered. And there's already some things we already know, like that are good, or you know, at some level. And so now what we really want is to generalize in a way that can tell us where another mode could be potentially very far, not just necessarily like a neighbor of things we've already visited. So this is a generalization problem. And actually you can take this like, toy thing, you, you know, you put three modes on a grid and you ask a machine learning system that learns to generate, uh, you know, where it would put another candidate and, you know, with reasonable neural nets, it will tell you, go to the, you know, other grid point. So if it's, if it found the regularity here, like they are sitting on grid points, then it can like use the knowledge of those irregularities to guess where to look in places that are very far. And so you completely bypass the mixing problem because you're not doing like local moves to explore. You're using the pattern recognition ability of, of uh, machine learning, like generalization ability to discover patterns that allow you to guess, not with certainty, but you know, much better than chance where other modes might be. Is that crazy what I'm saying to you or does it sound reasonable? It's just a generalization problem. And machine learning is all about generalization, right? Uh, the reason where, you know, GPT-4 works is because it has, even though it has never seen the particular context question you're asking, it has discovered enough structure, enough statistical structure, enough positive to most of the time give you a pretty sensible answer. So it's kind of the same thing we're exploiting here. It's the core of you know, why machine learning works, we can just apply it here to this problem of discovery of new modes, like different things we haven't tried, which might work. It's just a generalization, but instead of generalizing to the usual supervised learning problem of like, you know, is this a cat or a dog? We're generalizing in the space of generative models. Here. Where are the places of high probability mass? Where are the places that can have a high score, a high reward? Okay. So I hope that answers the previous question. All right, so now we have to deal with these neural nets. Um, and yeah, so, so there's another difference between machine learning methods and neural nets and MCMC besides the mixing thing. So with MCMC, um, there's no training, of course, right? I mean, there are machine learning methods applied in MCMC, but let's you know, ignore that for now. But but there's no training. You all of the computational cost is is paid when you're trying to sample. Like you're basically like trying things and, and keeping the things that are good. Um, with machine learning, what we're going to do is we're going to pay a big price upfront training the neural net. Once it's trained, we can sample from it. It's very quick. You know, it's like GPT four, uh, hopefully faster. Um, and and so at runtime, um, uh, sampling is going to be cheap. With MCMC, it's very expensive. You you know you might have to do a lot of um, sampling to get to mix between modes, which can take forever. So we we have this trade off between the cost we pay upfront to train the system, and then the cost we pay at runtime to like actually generate to get samples. So that's why these are called amortized predictors. We you know. We uh, we have this amortization of the total costs with upfront pain. Um, okay. Um, okay, so how is that going to look like? Remember, we're going to train neural nets to generate candidate, say, molecules. So, so the way we can decompose that, as, as I said in like this slide, is we're going to decompose the problem of generating something like a molecule um, through a sequence of actions, sequence of steps, right? So, so then we're going to have a neural net for each of these steps, but it's going to be the same neural net because, of course, you know, there's a huge number of potential contexts, but the neural net is going to use uh, an input that specifies what we have already generated and then it's going to tell us how to make a small change to it, like add a node to the graph, 
or add an edge or something yeah add the bond add an atom you know whatever so you have you're going to have to define a sort of language with a set of actions such that by sequencing these actions you can construct any of the things you want in some space of things you'd like to generate so it's going to be something like a graph neural net right um that takes a representation of the current partially constructed candidate and then takes a simple action maybe with a softmax or maybe choose an atom choose a position choose whatever um and and then we're going to sample from that neural net it's going to give us an action um and then we take that action and we use it to change the current state into a new state so that's st becomes st plus one and then we call again the neural net and so when does this loop end well there's going to be a special action on the output side of the neural net that says okay i'm done i don't want to add anything and then you have your candidate that you can call um your proxy you know scoring function with and so so now what we're going to be learning is this neural net it embeds a policy from a, like like in the same meaning as policy and reinforcement learning except that policy is not going to be trained to maximize rewards it's going to be trained to uh sample proportionally to the rewards okay um so so there's, there's a subtle thing that I kind of mentioned earlier, which is when we construct things like molecules or graphs, in general, if you consider a sequence of actions that will produce your candidate, your, your intermediate states or your final state, uh, there could be many paths, many trajectories that could lead to the same place. So if you were to like mentally do like we do in this figure, uh, consider all the possible sequences of actions. Of course you can't, but you, you can just like imagine it. And on paper, you have like a toy version, like here, you know, you start with like a single node and then you you add a neighbor um, and you connect it, you, you add another neighbor, you know, and so you can construct a graph like this by small actions that are each pretty straightforward. Um, and at some point, you know, uh, you, you may have the special action here to end the generation. But you can see that some of those graphs can be obtained in different ways. So that turns out to have an effect on the kinds of algorithms we can use. Um, and the methods that exist in reinforcement learning uh, usually don't cope with that uh, very well. And so we've invented methods, the generative flow networks that I'm gonna talk about that allow to take that into account properly. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into the mathematical details here, but the idea is we're going to learn that policy that generates forward, but we're also going to learn a backward policy that undoes what we learn. So if you think about any particular intermediate state, um, you know, you can have different actions that bring you to other states and you learn a probability for each of these actions. But you can also consider like some state and ask, well, how could I have constructed these states? What what could have been the previous state? and the corresponding action that could have led to where I am now. So that's a backward policy. And we don't need it at runtime, but it turns out that um, if we learn it at the same time as the forward policy, we can have a training objective that's going to give us the guarantee that when we minimize the training objective, um, we will have what we want. We will have a policy like a neural net that generates these objects with exactly the right probability of course in practice we never get the training objective to zero but we can get it you know arbitrarily small if we train long enough so yeah some math but you see the the actors here are just the the forward policy pf the backward policy that i just mentioned the reward function so that's the black box we can query to see how good is is a candidate so like our proxy and Z here is an unknown constant, which is the normalizing constant, you know, of the Boltzmann distribution, the, the integral over all the states of the reward function. Um, we don't know it, so it's just going to be a free parameter in this, and uh, it's going to come out as a, as a result of the learning as well. So we had a first paper on these kinds of models called GFlow nets for uh, generative flow networks um, in... Uh, 2021 at Ed was president at NeurIPS. Um, and uh, Emmanuel Bengio, who's my son, 
uh, let down paper. Um, and um, yeah, it gave rise to a huge number of other papers. So there's like uh, dozens of papers following up that thing. So it might be interesting for you guys to come back to that paper because it was motivated by the problem of uh, uh, molecule generation. But it, it turned out that this is useful in many other settings in machine learning. Um, so yeah. Um, I think in, in that 2021 paper, we already did experiments where we compare this GFlowNet approach to a um, MCMC approach called MART, MARS. We also compare it to a standard reinforcement learning approach called PPO. Um, and these had already been used in the context of molecule discovery, of compound discovery. Uh, we also set up a particular way to construct the molecules with fragments that are added, you know, one little bit at a time. Um, and um, yeah, and, and basically we found that uh, we we get both like high rewards, high scores for the, the, the molecules we end up uh, generating, but also a high diversity, which is something that people don't didn't usually measure, but we cared a lot about because of all the motivation I gave you before. So there are various measures of diversity and of course the average reward, that's easy. Um, and what we see on these plots is, you know, as we um, uh, consider like uh, training this thing more, like with more calls, uh, how well are the best thing that it finds and how many like different good things that it does, does it find. So the, the blue curve curves on the left and right are the results of um, our work. Okay. Um, yeah, let me skip that. Um, another paper that followed just a few months later um, is one where we introduced active learning in the process. And that was led by Mox Jain, uh, who's one of my PhD students. Um, and in the paper, we applied the GFLONET setting with active learning. So with epistemic uncertainty estimation um, to construct the score to a bunch of different uh, problems. Um, so I think I introduced all of these actors already. Um, in particular, we worked on small protein sequences um, and uh, antimi antimicrobial uh, uh, peptides as the space that we wanted to search over. Um, and again, like we, we find that these things give us a good trade-off between the things I've been mentioning in the beginning. So the performance, like the, the affinity that we're looking for, the diversity of these uh, much, much larger than like um, the other methods that we compared and novelty, which is kind of related to diversity, but really is a different thing. Uh, but in, in our case, it just came out, the novelty just came out as a side effect of diversity, right? Not something we had to program uh, explicitly to, um, um, to obtain. Um, another paper that followed the year after on multi-objective chief flow nets. So, um, you know, uh, overlapping set of authors here. Um, so that was last uh, summer, right? So, so this, this introduced um, a notion of uh, searching using multiple objectives. So looking at the Pareto frontier. So just to explain quickly what that means, um, you know, maybe there are two objectives that you care about and you're not sure what is the right trade-off between those objectives. And since we're going to be generating a bunch of candidates, not just one, the like rational thing to do is to say, well, let's try to find uh, a bunch of candidates which cover what's called this Pareto frontier, like the things that are good, the best possible trade-off between the two objectives. So these are like the colored points here, right? So we want diversity on the Pareto front. And of course, for each of these places, is there, what's going on? Okay, sorry. Uh, for each of these places, uh, like a particular trade-off between one objective and the other, you also want diversity in molecular space. So we now have like two kinds of diversities. There's diversity in the sense of diverse trade-offs between the different objectives, that's the Pareto frontier. And there's diversity in the sense of like, different types of molecules for the same trade-off. 
right? So, so the paper explores how we can modify the GFLNet recipe to account for that. Um, another variant that is is uh, is something we're like working on now, and there's a paper uh, online for um, is uh, introducing introducing the notion that's important in experimental design of multi-fidelity active learning. So, what does that mean? Um, you may uh, you remember the funnel that we had, right? So you can do different kinds of experiments that evaluate our candidates uh, with a different trade-off of costs, maybe computational cost or experimental costs versus um, accuracy, right? So we can have a cheap experiment or we can have an expensive experiment and we can have actually a whole spectrum of experiments. We could, we call these oracles, right? So you have a set of oracles. So there are functions that evaluate candidates, say candidate molecules and, and they're black box functions, but some are cheap. So we can call a lot of them and some are expensive. And so we, um, we, can't, we can't call off. So we need to like, uh, have our experimental design now, not just propose candidates, but propose what experiment should I do on this candidate? And um, and so so this paper explores how we can do that. There's already a rich literature in active learning for doing these things, but we've kind of incorporated some of these ideas again in this GFlowNet pipeline. Um, and I, I don't have time to give you results, but basically it does what you expect. Um, it, if you allow the thing to learn what experiment to try so that is to be efficient, right? So if you think of the way to think about efficiency is like how many interesting things do I get per budget? So each experiment has a budget, has a cost, and you got a total budget. So given a total budget, what is the best use of that resource? And now I'm allowed to do like cheap things and expensive things. So yeah. Um, all right. I think uh, I should like maybe stop here to give some time for questions. I have more things, but uh, it's already a lot, probably. Um, so, please. If you have any question, raise your hand. I bring the material. So, uh, some slides ago, when you had uh, those multiple modes, um, and you were saying that that these uh, neural nets are ideally trying to find out new modes. Yes. Yes. Going through a slow sampling process of NCC. Yes. Are you kind of assuming that basically there's an uh, implicit unknown true function f that has basically given rise to these modes and you try yes. to recover that in a and that you're assuming that the that function f is structured in some sort of way yes they're not at random actually that kind of yes space. yes absolutely is that the, the right way to think about that's it? the right way to think about it um there's an unknown function you can uh, query the value of that function the function is positive so it's like a density and you're trying to find the places where it's high and so these are the modes so that's the setup right you you know I have this black box oracle i can call it and i i want to find the value of that function but i care about the high values of that function so getting the function right at the level of like very small values uh you know plus or minus 10 percent i don't care but plus or minus ten percent for the high values. Well, that's that could be significant for my 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 task. But but yeah, that's the setup exactly. And the reason machine learning is able to do something is because the function f has structure. If the function f is random, like basically think of like uh, a mixture of Gaussians, where the Gaussians are placed randomly, like there there is no structure. Then then machine learning is not going to help you. I mean, it can help you to the for the local search, but that you can do that with MCMC. It's not going to be a big difference. So really, um, it's in the case where there is structure. And in physics and chemistry, we know there is structure, right? The underlying, the reason there is structure is that the underlying laws of physics are like simple, right? So there's got to be structure. Now, what is that structure? That's what machine learning helps to discover. Hi, um, uh, thank you for that really great talk. Um, so I had a question about the uh, objective for the general flow network. So can you provide a little bit more intuition on why we include 
the backwards pol uh, policy as well? Or yes. Trajectory? Okay, so let me explain that objective. By the way, that objective is called trajectory balance. It's one of the objectives that's being proposed uh, for training GFlow nets. It's, it's, and it, it is the one that's most commonly used. That's why I put it here. And the way um, this objective comes from, um, so you, you have the training objective in the bottom, but let's look at the top. Um, so the, the bottom is obtained from the top by saying, okay, we want to satisfy this constraint everywhere, like every sequence of states, S1, S2, S3, and so on, must satisfy this constraint. And then we take the log of the left-hand side minus the log of the right-hand side and square that. And it's just a quantity that has the property that when it is zero, we know the constraint is satisfied. So now let's look at that constraint. So that constraint is actually pretty easy to understand. The left-hand side is the probability of a sequence of actions, a sequence of states, by just multiplying the probabilities of taking this one and then that one and that one, right? So it's probability of the whole trajectory. The right-hand side is also a probability of the whole trajectory, but going backwards, okay? So we know the probability of the final state is just the reward function divided, normalized. So that's the probability of the final thing. And then given the final thing, we go one step before and then one step before, and we multiply all these probabilities going backwards. So basically you've got a trajectory. You can calculate the probability of this trajectory going forward, just apply the, the, the policy and multiply all the probability, the conditional probabilities along the way. Or you can get the probability going backwards, start from something at the end, and, and we, we, we know that the final distribution should have this marginal probability, which is the reward normalized, and then multiply by the conditional probabilities for all the previous states, given the previous states and so on, going backwards. So you've got two joint distribution. You can construct it one way, or you can construct it the other way. They should be equal, right? And so now it turns out, very simple math, that you take this constraint and um, you can show that when the constraint is satisfied, then the left-hand side will sample, the, the, the policy will sample final states as n with exactly the right probability. And it just comes out of the fact that these probabilities sum to one, I mean, the, the PF and PB, they're probabilities and that's it. Um, so very, very simple algebra shows that this constraint, when it's satisfied for every trajectory, gives you that the policy samples proportionally to R. And so now we take that constraint, which should be true for every trajectory. And we say now, we're going to take a loss that is trying to make those constraints satisfied. We measure the uh, how much uh, we violate the constraint. That's the bottom thing uh, for any trajectory. So we can take any trajectory and see how much our current neural net uh, uh, doesn't you know satisfy the constraint. And we make a gradient step to make that trajectory you know be uh, uh, handled better, like you know get the satisfy the constraint better. And then we look at another trajectory and, and so on and so on. Hi. Um, the performance of exploration strategies entirely depends, not entirely, but strongly depends on the complexity of the problem. So for yes. physics and chemistry, we would say it's it's hard. Do you have any work on like the mid-campaign performance we have? You know, we go through the loop and then we have another $20 million to spend, but we want to know how much we're actually converging to finding the haystack, uh, the needle in the haystack, or are we just going to spend money and then that's it? Okay, so the question is, how much money should I spend on the next bunch of experiments? As well Maybe as well, yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, I don't know, I, I, we haven't looked at that, but the closest to that is the multi-fidelity work, right? So if you're able to take into account the costs of experiments, um, then you might be able to do that sort of thing. So, so now you could say, well, you know the cost of different experiments at different levels. And, um, and so you, you give yourself a budget that includes all of the you know, points in the funnel, not just the, the next one. So, so now if you train these systems that take costs into account, what actually naturally happens is initially they're going to spend all their money on the cheap things. And at some point, they start shifting and wanting to do more expensive experiments because they have more knowledge that something is worth doing at the more you know higher price. So it just comes out naturally. Now, in practice, you would want to add constraints, maybe uh, like we that we didn't do. Like, oh, you 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 should be doing blocks of uh, you know uh, hundred thousand dollars each or something. You know, but the, you know things that are like practical logistical constraints should be added to this sort of thing. But but I think that's the right kind of setup. 
where you you uh, include not just how good is a candidate, but how expensive was the experiment in order to do do your planning in a way that takes the the costs and the budgets into account, and probably other constraints that which we didn't in practice. There's going to be a lot of constraints when, when you do these things for real, of course. Yeah, so thank you for your talk. So my question is about the novelty. I didn't get the meaning of D naught in the formula. Sorry, I, I didn't understand the words you said. The novelty of the, the set D. Mm, after the diversity, there is the next metric. Yes. Um. So you, you have a question about epistemic uncertainty? Is that this one? No, no, no. Number five. Number five. number five. Yes. So earlier than that. Yes. So no. The next one. Okay. Ah, here. Yeah. So the less the the oh the D last, here is it yes. distance? No, D not. S J B. Oh, D, D not. Yes. Um so D not is the initial set. Right, so you you have already some molecules that you know are like pretty good, and this is just measuring how far you are with your new candidates, how far you are from that initial set. That's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's people here as well, but you know maybe in the back we didn't get many questions. So, um, so since some drug discovery uh, campaigns can be very hard, and some targets are intrinsically hard to find hits for. I think it's fair to assume that, especially in the beginning, our oracle might just return negative labels because we are unable to find an initial binder. Okay, so like zero reward all the time. Yes. Um, is it fair to assume that the model will pick the signal up as well and will start to no. just if you get if you get key? if you always get zero reward, there's nothing you can learn from that except oh things look bad, um, and so you do need somehow to bootstrap with things that are have signal. Otherwise, you can't. I mean, otherwise you can do random search until you find some things that are good. But in order to guide the search, you need to already have some positives, right? And so maybe um, if I were to give like a practical advice in these situations, first get rid of having a binary signal and try to get a signal that's richer. So maybe, you know, if it if it goes from zero or one to zero to one, you know, maybe even going from 0.01 to 0.02 is a signal, right? So, so that's one strategy. The other is, of course, we usually have uh, lots of other things we know from maybe other campaigns. And uh, you know, one of the biggest successes of machine learning over the last decade, as we can see with like LLMs, is transfer, right? So if you train on more stuff than your particular task, uh, if you do it right, it doesn't always work, but you know, there's a huge potential for generalizing with very little data, even zero data to a new task. So that would be the other direction. I mean, in chemistry, I know it's hard, but I think that's still worth continuing to push in that direction. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering about multi-fidelity GFONets. Yes. Um, in particular, in practice, uh, different reward functions might not necessarily be similar in a lot of ways. So oh, that's the multi-objective, you mean? Uh, no, I, I, I'm, I mean more. I actually meant multi fidelity, as in if if you have um, oracles that measure the same property, I guess with different fidelities. Oh, you mean they output different kind of numbers? Yeah, essentially. What are the constraints? Like, if you have different. Oracles, okay, so yeah, in that setup, we somehow need to bring the outcome into a unified set of units. So there's there's ways to do that. So you could learn how the outcomes of one type of experiment predict the outcomes of a like more expensive one so that you can bring, you can convert the, if you want the units of a one like cheap experiment into the units of an expensive experiment plus uncertainty, which you can also estimate, right? So, so yeah, the, the math here requires somehow a unified kind of unit of goodness for all of the experiments, but I think that's feasible with more machine learning. One last question. Hi, uh, 
so uh, so when we are dealing with uncertainty can you speak in, louder please okay uh, so when we are dealing with uncertainty in yes. some applications the reward function itself would be a proxy for some sort of yeah, objective yeah, notion of, of relevance. So we, we need to estimate the uncertainty. No, okay, so it's not that the reward function is uncertain. It's the, it's the predictor that we use, like the proxy is uncertain. So we, we're going to estimate its uncertainty. There are various methods for that. Like you can have a Bayesian uh, linear regression at the last layer is one of the easy things you can do. Uh, drop out and, you know, other methods. Um, and then we're going to take the proxy output plus or combined with our uncertainty to get um, a, a number that's going to be our reward. So uh, my question would be, are there any applications where, let's say you are dealing with multiple objectives, but you need a diversity between the objectives themselves? You need some sort Yeah, of well, that's, that's the job of the chemist, not my job. <laughs> Sorry. Well, let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, Joshua won't have time to take questions, so let him leave. And yeah, <laughs> and then if you have any question, please ask on on portal, and we will relate those second. So during the break, there is water. There are water, many water bottles on the desk, on the registration desk. You can take one each, and uh, yeah, we'll be back at eleven for the next talk.